So I'll be honest, I'm not what you would call a huge fan of the Mortal Kombat franchise. I mean, yes, I played the original game all those many, many, many years ago. But ultimately, I was more of a Street Fighter 2 kind of guy. I did look forward to watching the very first live-action Mortal Kombat movie though, and despite all of its faults, was thoroughly entertained. Same with the sequel. And I also looked forward to the new take of the franchise in 2021. But after watching it, the only question I had in my mind was... Who the hell was this guy supposed to be? When it comes to an established group of characters, it's never easy being the new guy. Regardless though, introducing a cast of characters or a franchise to a potentially new audience through the point of view of an outsider is a very common storytelling device. Sometimes it works wonders with the new guy crossing over and for better or worse becoming a household name or at least a fan favorite like... I don't know, Wolverine in the original 2000s X-Men movie or Jin Erso in Rogue One. But in other cases, such as Cole Young in Mortal Kombat, or in my opinion, Andra from Kevin Smith's take on the Masters of Universe, it doesn't go over well with the fandom, often feeling unnecessary or forced. At the end of the day though, it all boils down to how the characters are written into the story and if they are interesting in themselves to begin with. And fortunately for Duke, the writers of the very first G.I. Joe animated miniseries did a pretty good job in introducing us to the new Joe on the block. Released in 1983, G.I. Joe, a real American hero, The Mass Device, was one of the most watched animated series of my childhood. I mean, by that time, I was already a huge fan of the toys, and so it was a real big deal for me to see my favorite Joe toys come to life on the television screen. Given that it was released in 1983, the show featured Joes from the first two years of the toy line. We got familiar 82 characters like Snake Eyes, Scarlet, and Stalker, mixed in with slightly newer ones from the following year like Gung Ho, Torpedo, and Snow Job. But there was one character I was not familiar with at all, and he was literally the first face and voice we hear in the opening intro shouting that familiar and now iconic battle cry of yeah! It really wasn't much of a surprise that I had absolutely no idea who the hell Duke, the first sergeant and apparently leader of the Joes was. His original action figure was first made available only as an exclusive mail-away figure in 1983, something not available to a kid like me living outside of the US, and his toy would only be made available on retail in the following year. Still, that didn't stop the writers from basically making him the central character of the first miniseries. But despite the odds stacked up against Duke and the potential for things to go the wrong way for him, ultimately, I believe his introduction worked. I mean, while admittedly he's not as popular or iconic as, say, Snake Eyes, he still is widely regarded as one of the main characters in the franchise. Now, I can only speculate on the reasons of why the character of Duke worked, but here's what I think. First and foremost, at the time, G.I. Joe definitely needed a leader. Sure, there was Hawk from the original wave, but for some reason, he never quite caught on. At least for me. Visually, he was just one of the other green men. His action figure even shared the exact head sculpt with another blondie in the group, Short Fuse. And it came packed in with a rather plain missile system. Nothing about him really screamed leader. In the original Marvel comics, at least for the very first few issues, the team was actually led by General Flag. Hawk was kind of a non-entity. The most eventful thing about Hawk that I remember was when he got shot by Cobra Commander and was out of commission for a bit. So when something as important as their first animated series, the Joe team needed an obvious leader that we could all latch onto, which is the role that Duke filled to a T. Secondly, from a visual standpoint, he had his own unique look, with his beige top breaking up the predominantly monochromatic look of most of the original team. And of course, he was blonde, something that almost all leaders of the 80s were for some reason. And thirdly, from the start, he was already portrayed as a cool character. In the opening action scene, he is already showing off how cool he was by doing somersaults to avoid aircraft fire from above and simultaneously saving and flirting with the only female member of the team introduced so far in Scarlet with this iconic line of Didn't you read my green sheet? Man of action. Which was, I believe, a nice reference to the 1960s British licensed equivalent to G.I. Joe, Action Man. Anyway, while technically Duke wasn't the new guy in the show, 
he was already established to be the leader of the team from the start, to the viewers like myself, he was the new guy who was meant to be the focal point for us to follow. I believe that he was designed and written to be the character that us, the kids, would want to be. Duke was easy to like. While he didn't break the mold, he was safe and very charismatic. And so the story goes, Duke is the Joe who gets captured by Cobra, fights a huge giant of a guy in some gladiatorial arena, wins the affections of another girl, and with her help manages to escape and leads the Joes to the Cobra's hidden base to ultimately win the day. This was the hero's journey that we as kids would have loved to see ourselves take. Well, for whatever reason, Duke really worked for me, and since then, he has always been a favorite of mine. So much so that when I went to the U.S. in 1985, he was the first toy that I got in Toys R Us. Well, him and Lady J. And Airtight. I don't know what it was, but as a kid, actually even now as a grown-up, I've always gravitated more towards the goody-goody boy scout leader type character, as opposed to the more cutting-edge, moody, and broody types. For me, it was always Captain America over Wolverine, Superman over Batman, and of course, Mickey over Donald. Mm, actually, sorry, no. Donald is the man. Oh, I mean Duck. You know what I mean? For me, Duke checked out all of the boxes. Leader? Check. Good guy? Check. Competent in battle? Check. Ladies man? Check. Blonde? Bonus check. And finally, cool voice? check. Speaking of his voice, Duke was played by the voice actor Michael Bell, who was also the voice of the Autobot military strategist Prowl. On the flip side, Duke's evil counterpart Cobra Commander was voiced by the late Chris Lada, whose iconic raspy tone also gave life to the Decepticon Starscream. Anyway, I always found it funny how the voices of both the leaders in G.I. Joe basically voiced second fiddle characters to the leaders in Transformers. Anyway, while all of his cool qualities were all fine and dandy for kids, Duke's straight-laced heroic character wasn't something that in general appealed to an older audience. And as such, when many Joe fans started latching onto the slightly more serious Marvel comics, it was characters like Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow who became more popular with their more complicated backstories and more nuanced personalities. I mean, don't get me wrong, Duke was a fairly used character in the comics and he even made a very memorable debut when he saved the entire Joe team from being gunned down by a Cobra Rattler as they lay exposed and unarmed during the funeral of General Flag. Duke arrives just in the nick of time and totally takes down the Cobra Bomber with nothing but his trusty pistol. Okay, okay, he had a little help from his buddy Roadblock and his massive Browning .50 caliber machine gun. But that's beside the point. After saving the team from certain death from above, without skipping a beat, Duke introduces himself as the new top sergeant, promising to make their sorry lot into soldiers. It's a very un-Duke portrayal, bordering more on Sergeant Slaughter territory if you ask me, which doesn't come to much of a surprise as even the legendary writer Larry Hama admitted that he never could quite get the handle of Duke's character. As in, in his experience in the military, it was often the commanding officer who played the good cop role to the first sergeant as the bad cop. And Duke, as first sergeant, just never really sort of fit in that bad cop mold. And speaking of his rank, as a kid, I could never quite understand how Duke, with his rank of first sergeant, could be officially recognized as the leader of the G.I. Joe team. Well, okay, if you wanted to be technical about it, second in command after Hawk. I mean, I'm not an expert in military ranks, but anyone with access to Google can learn that technically Joes like Flint, who was a warrant officer, or even the Conquest X-30 pilot Slipstream, who was a lieutenant, should have easily outranked Duke. But the work around this, apparently, is that Duke should have been ranked higher. It's just that he refused promotions that would effectively put him behind the battle lines, as his preference was to be out in the field with his men. As he states in his own file card, they tell me that an officer's job is to impel others to take the risks so that the officer survives to take the blame in the event of total catastrophe. With all due respect, sir, if that's what an officer does, I don't want any part of it. Again, from what I recall, Duke didn't do anything memorable in the original Marvel comics. But he was always in the thick of things, as during an ill-fated mission in the Middle Eastern nation of Trucial Abysmia, wherein a Joe convoy led by Duke is captured by Cobra and things turn ugly real fast. Long story short, 
In an unprecedented move, a good number of Joes are killed off, including original 13-member Breaker and other favorites like Doc, Crazy Legs, and Quick Kick. Of course, Duke manages to survive, which is something he seems to have a knack of being able to do most of the time. But before we go any further, I'd like to take a quick detour and invite all of you, my lovely viewers, to try out joining my channel as an awesome member. If you regularly enjoy the stories that I put out every week, I'd like to give you more. I'm talking about sweet perks like early access to my videos and exclusive ones as well, like first impressions, collection tours, latest updates, and whatever unscripted ramblings come to mind. Yes, I know that this will all cost you a teeny tiny bit, but I remain committed to making sure that it'll be worth it for you. And I will continue to add even more perks, like maybe special polls to decide what stories to tell next, as soon as I figure them out. As always, it's a little thing that will go a long way to help me grow my channel. But either way, rest assured, everything else currently on the channel, meaning the regular stories that you've been enjoying, will remain as is. This is just a little something extra. So I hope you can give being a channel member a shot. But if you're not keen on joining right now or ever, that's perfectly fine. Your continued viewership and support is more than enough. So thank you. Anyway, back to Duke. So apparently narrowly surviving a dire situation is something he does quite well. And in 1987, he managed to cheat death yet again thanks to the help of a certain heroic Autobot, Optimus Prime. So as the story goes, in the mid-80s, Hasbro was riding high with the financial success of a number of their toy lines and as such, felt confident enough in three of their best-selling toy lines, namely Transformers, G.I. Joe, and My Little Pony, to invest into their transition to the big screen. Aside from hopefully reaching an even wider audience, one of Hasbro's main objectives for these movies was to introduce new characters to sell new toys. And as such, at least for the boy brands, the directive from above was to literally kill off characters who no longer had toys currently selling in the stores. And so in 1986, Transformers the movie made its grand debut to excited audiences and then proceeded to kill off in rather graphic fashion familiar and favorite characters like Brawn, Prowl, Ratchet, and Ironhide, and of course, the ultimate cherry on top, the beloved Autobot leader himself, Optimus Prime. And the audience, specifically the kids, freaked out. Apparently, Hasbro sorely underestimated how much of an emotional connection kids had with the noble Autobot leader and how traumatic it would be for them to see their hero and in many ways their father figure die before their eyes. Anyway, bottom line, kids cried and the parents got mad and let Hasbro know about it. The movie unfortunately bombed big time and while not related, so did My Little Pony. This unfortunate series of events basically led Hasbro to switch the already finished G.I. Joe movie to a home video only release in 1987, with one major significant change. See, by that time, Duke's action figure had been discontinued in retail stores, and so taking a cue from Transformers, he was scheduled to meet his maker in the G.I. Joe movie as well. Story-wise, it was to make way for the G.I. Joe Falcon, who was to be introduced as the new main character of the movie and as Duke's irresponsible half-brother. Actually, the original plan was to make him Hawk Sun or something, hence the similar bird-themed code names. But anyway, Duke's death scene was done and animated wherein he selflessly takes a snake spear thrown by Serpentor, originally meant for Falcon, to his heart, and he expires in the lap of his beloved Scarlet. Yes, I am Team Dukelet, or is that Scar Duke? Whatever, sue me. Of course, after the whole prime death debacle, Hasbro had to make a quick pivot and Duke, the man of action, was saved with a hastily thrown in line of dialogue of him slipping into a coma and in the literal last minute of the movie, Doc proudly announcing over the comms to the rest of the team. Gerald Hawk, do you read me? This is Doc at headquarters. Great news, Duke's come out of his coma. Looks like we made it. Then Doc says Duke's gonna be A-OK. -okay. Yo, Yo, Joe! Joe! Duke lives in the movies. Well, the animated one at least. See, apparently, Duke isn't as lucky in the live action scene. Okay, to be fair, Duke, played by the actor Channing Tatum, was the main character in the 2009 movie, The Rise of Cobra. Now, with all due respect to the actor Channing Tatum, 
he wouldn't be my first choice to play Duke. I mean, visually, he really doesn't strike me as the man of action. More of the man of dance. But yeah, Tatum was Duke, and his Duke was definitely the new guy in this movie, where he and his buddy Stalker, I mean Ripcord, are recruited into the already existing International Special Missions Force, G.I. Joe. Anyway, the movie is... Not awful, but far from memorable or faithful to the original material as Duke runs around Paris in some sort of mech suit and apparently is the former lover of the Baroness and former best friend of her brother, Rex, who eventually becomes Cobra Co- I mean, the Doctor. Talk about a bizarre love triangle. Anyway, apparently Channing Tatum, who was supposedly an OG fan of the toys, wasn't very happy with the first movie or the direction it took. Can you really blame him? In later interviews, he admitted that he hated it and only did it because he was contractually obligated to do so. And so, when plans were laid out for the 2013 sequel Retaliation, Tatum requested to have his character, Duke, killed off. And since they already had their new big star in Dwayne Johnson aka The Rock signed on, the producers granted Tatum's wish and Duke was killed off in the first act of the movie. No serpent spear to the heart this time though, just some ambiguous vehicular explosion that kinda left room for his possible survival somewhere on down the line. But there was no part 3 after Retaliation, as the franchise was soft rebooted years later with the Snake Eyes origin movie. But that's a story for another time. All that's important to note here is that while Tatum's Duke is definitely dead, a new live action Duke is still in play for whatever new continuity is still to come. And speaking of different continuities, I think it's worth noting that there have been attempts to make Duke go beyond his clean-cut Boy Scout image in later comics after the original Marvel run. Devil's Jew, the publisher that took over the G.I. Joe license in the early 2000s, tried their hand at giving a fresh take on Duke. Aside from continuing where the Marvel series left off, Devil's Jew also published another series called G.I. Joe Reloaded, which was meant to be a completely new and modern take on the Joes. Think Marvel's Ultimate Universe. Anyway, while I never actually read the series, I mean, it didn't last very long, it is notable for making Duke an actual traitor, an agent of Cobra who eventually meets his end at the hands of Scarlet, of all people. A more promising take, though, would be the one being done by the current license holder, Skybound Entertainment. Duke starts similarly enough as a highly decorated soldier until he literally comes face to face with the Decepticon Starscream and barely lives to tell about it. Unfortunately, his friend goes splat in between the Decepticon's hand in midair. See, being the current publishing license holder of the Transformers as well, Skybound, led by Robert Kirkman of Walking Dead fame, has been slowly and carefully crafting a new joint Energon universe. And while the whole G.I. Joe Transformers crossover thing has been done time and time again since the 80s, this time around, it seems like a really legit, long-term, maximum effort by Skybound. They're literally starting from ground zero, with the Transformers waking up and resuming their battle on an Earth where both G.I. Joe and Cobra don't exist. Yet. So anyway, Duke is one of the first humans to make contact with the robots in disguise and is extremely traumatized by his near-death experience. Duke goes rogue in an effort to uncover the truth behind the robots, much to the chagrin of the shadowy General Hawk, who sends future Joe members Stalker and Rock and Roll after him. Anyway, this is still an ongoing story, so the jury is still out on it, but I'm liking what I've read so far. Plus, rogue Duke with long, unkept hair and a beard? Noise. Anyway, regardless of how people may feel about Duke, even if he will never reach the heights of popularity as Snake Eyes or if you're more of a Flint is the cooler leader guy, there's no denying Duke's importance in G.I. Joe. Ever since his very close brush with death in the 1987 movie, Duke has since always had an action figure in every iteration of G.I. Joe. As early as 1988, a new Tiger-themed repainted Duke was released in retail, and finally in 1992, a completely newly sculpted Duke followed. All the way up to 2007, when the then-dormant Joe toy line was relaunched with two box sets, one for Joe's and one for Cobra, of five modernized action figures each, to celebrate G.I. Joe a Real American Hero's 25th anniversary, and not surprisingly, heading the good guys was Duke himself. 
And like I said, since then, Duke has been everywhere. In 2009, he was the uncharacteristically badass and no-nonsense leader in the G.I. Joe Resolute micro-series, which was a more mature, realistic-ish, and definitely more violent take on the real American heroes. The highlight of which for me was towards the end, where Scarlet reaffirms her choice of Duke over Snake Eyes. Yes! Then, in 2010, a younger, less experienced version of Duke led a team of Joes in the cartoon series Renegades, where the Joes, or future Joes, were reimagined into a sort of ragtag, A teamish bunch of fugitives on the run from the military, but at the same time trying to uncover and expose the suspicious activities of a pharmaceutical company called Dun 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 Cobra Industries. That same year came, in my opinion, the best 118th scale G.I. Joe subline called The Pursuit of Cobra, where we got two awesome dukes. The first one was a standard-ish version that came with a futuristic portable missile system. A bit of overkill if you ask me, but it was cool nonetheless. But my favorite would have to be his jungle version, which kinda seemed like an homage to the character Dutch from the very first Predator movie. A seeming stretch until you put him together with his fellow Joe's Spirit and Rakondo, who looked a lot like Dutch's fellow mercenaries, Billy and Blaine respectively. And you throw in the new Cobra operative introduced, Shadow Tracker, who with his mysterious mask and dreads evokes the look of the Predator himself. And finally, in the next rebirth of the G.I. Joe toys, this time in the larger 112th scale, Duke was part of the very first wave of the G.I. Joe classified line. While I wasn't a big fan of the original, more futuristic design, I could not resist the straight-up retro Duke released a few years later. But as great as that Duke is, for me, my hands-down favorite would be the Ultimates version by the company Super 7, which stands slightly taller than your classified figure and is meant to be a plastic representation of Duke from the cartoons. And for me, it hits the mark in every way. Case in point, there have been shouting Duke head sculpts done in the past that look quite laughable in my opinion. But every time I look at this guy on my shelf, that iconic Yo Joe that I heard in the opening intro of the cartoon always plays in my head. This is the only plastic version of Duke to completely capture that man of action that I was introduced to all the way back in 1983. And when paired up with a reissued vintage Duke with an updated more tune accurate paint job, man, this duo is just complete nostalgic perfection for me. And speaking of perfection, I think that we can all agree that it would definitely take quite a degree of it to make it as a top model in the fashion industry, let alone a tank driving member of the G.I. Joe team. If you want to know more about this supermodel tank girl, I cover her story here. Or if you want other G.I. Joe stories, check out this playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more. <laughs>